All right, good morning. I'm Mary Jane Hayden from the State Railway Design Office. I'll be discussing some of the changes to the plans preparation manual, the PPM, for the 2016 update. First, let's talk about what this presentation will include. We'll begin with an overview of the update process that we use for changes to the PPM. Then we'll take a close look at some of the major changes to Volumes 1 and 2 that are included in this update. In the highlights, we'll be skipping over Chapters 4 and 7 of Volume 1 and cover them individually since the revision in those chapters were pretty substantial. For those that are not familiar with the PPM, it's a two-volume set. Volume 1 covers design criteria and process, and Volume 2 covers plans preparation and assembly. The PPM can be found online at the web address shown on the screen here. And please remember, if you want to receive notification of future updates of the PPM, please make sure you sign up to receive the department's contact mailer announcements. When users register themselves in this database, we're able to email important information to them on topics they select, such as updates, bulletins, and training. So to register yourself or for any information regarding your registration, such as updating personal contact information, topics of interest, and any other information in your profile, uh, you can access the contact management database at the website uh, shown here. And if you have any questions about the PPM in general or other railway design issues, you can contact Paul Hires or myself. We're both located here in the State Railway Design Office in the criteria section. All right, here's some background about our process for updating the manual. We have a team that's made up of district railway design engineers from each district. The team meets on a monthly basis via teleconference and GoToMeetings, and the purpose of these meetings is to discuss uh, current design issues and to draft changes to the manual. So these draft changes come from different sources. We get proposed changes from user input, district design engineer priorities, changes to manuals like AASHTO and the MUTCD, and other changes made by other offices. Typically, a draft of our proposed change is uh, worked up by our office, and it's sent out to district personnel and also FHWA for review. Once we've received and addressed any comments from reviewers, we finalize the document and publish it on the web. Now, we only produce an update for the PPM once per year, and it's in January. Certainly, there's times when urgent issues arise and call for a revision or a correction. This is usually for something that's related to safety or maybe a fatal flaw. So whenever this occurs and it can't wait until the next scheduled update, we'll publish a design bulletin. These, along with previous editions of the PPM, are posted on our webpage for your information. Each of the railway design bulletins pertinent to the PPM that were issued during 2015 identify their own specific implementation timelines. In general, design bulletins affecting the PPM will remain effective until the official manual revision is published, which for the current version of the PPM was on January 1st of this year. I'll briefly discuss the railway design bulletins that impacted the PPM during 2015. The first one, Railway Design Bulletin 1507 established a process to satisfy the roundabout evaluation requirement. This can be found in a couple of locations within the PPM. In Chapter 25 of Volume 1, the 3R chapter, Section 25.4.17 simply states that when you have proposed changes in intersection control, you'll have to consider a roundabout alternative. This is discussed in more detail in Chapter 2 of Volume 2. Section 2.3.3 of Volume 2 identifies the items to include in your roundabout submittal package. I want to note here that we're calling this a 45% submittal package uh, because it needs to occur between 30% and 60% plans. It's not meant to be an additional full plan submittal. Instead, it's comparable to turning in, say, a typical section package. All right, next, let's, let's look at the Railway Design Bulletin 1508, which established new minimum signing and payment marking standards for interstate exit ramp intersections. This was added in Chapter 7 of Volume 1 as Section 7.2.11. This new section is meant to complement the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the MUTCD, 
And in addition to these two new figures, uh, language has been provided in this section to describe the new requirements at exit ramp intersections. The purpose of this new section is to provide clearer direction to motorists in these particular intersections. Railway Design Bulletin 15-14 was released in late 2015 as a precaution to address an observed oscillating behavior of pivotal adjustable hangar assemblies on traffic signals at wind speeds below the design wind speed. So as you can see on the screen here, the change was simply removing the word pivotal. It should also be noted that the design bulletin stated that, again, uh, this is a precautionary measure that's pending completion of current research on this issue. Railway Design Bulletin 15-02 established a new pavement marking selection criteria for both asphalt and concrete surfaces. Chester Henson will be discussing this in more detail during his presentation on the changes that were made to Chapter 7 of Volume 1, which is the Traffic and ITS Design Chapter. Railway Design Bulletin 15-10 prohibited the use of warning lights on temporary traffic control devices. This guidance is based on a research study performed in 2013 for the department, which evaluated the effectiveness of warning lights on temporary traffic control devices. The final recommendation of this study was to discontinue the application of warning lights in all work zones. Retroreflective sheeting materials that are currently used uh, provide adequate delineation for signing and channelizing devices. So the change to the PPM was to simply remove the section on warning lights, which was formerly section 10.8.1. Roe Design Bulletin 15-13 incorporated new policy regarding the use of fire suppression systems on department-owned limited access facilities, bridges, and retaining walls. The department has determined that the details for standpipes, valves, and hydrants that have been used on past projects for fire suppression systems located within traffic railings and roadway barriers present significant snag hazards for errant vehicles and thus are not crashworthy. The photos on this slide illustrate the scenarios that this section is meant to avoid. So this new section, which is section 13.5.7 in chapter 13 of volume 1, basically says that if you want to install a fire suppression system, you'll need to have the approval of the chief engineer. Railway Design Bulletin 15-11 provided requirements for identifying structures that may need to be monitored during construction. Since there's already been a webinar on this particular topic, and FAQs are available through our website. We'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. If you have any questions related to this, please continue to contact Paul Hires. If you'd like to review the webinar on this topic or read through the uh, FAQs, please feel free to visit our web webinar library at the website shown here. All right, now we'll look at some of the changes that were made that didn't require a design bulletin. These were typically clarifications or things that were not urgent and could wait for the next edition to be published. Throughout the PPM, we began the process of updating the text to use the federal guidelines for plain language, which we have adopted. So as a first step, we did a global substitution of the word shall with must throughout the PPM. Then for sections or chapters where we had significant changes, we went ahead and revised the language to use active voice which eliminates the need for the word shall or must altogether. We did not, however, change the intent of the text. So as an example, in the 2015 PPM, we said uh, bicycle facilities shall be provided as required by Chapter 8 of this volume. In 2016, this sentence now reads, provide bicycle facilities as required by Chapter 8 of this volume. We'll continue to develop the PPM for the 2017 release with the same methodology. In the 2015 PPM, there was some language related to bike lanes that we felt could be more clear. In Chapter 2 of Volume 1, we updated Note Number 5 in the Special Lane Width Table, Table 2.1.2, to simply refer to Chapter 8, where uh, bicycle lane widths were discussed in more detail. 
And in Volume 1, Chapter 8, we modified the text of Section 8.4.1, having to do with bicycle lanes, to be more clear on the criteria for bike lanes for new construction and for 3R projects. In Chapter 2 of Volume 1, we found some clarifications that we wanted to make in the shoulder width and cross slopes table, which is Table 2.3.2. For divided arterials, we expanded note 7 in the table to clarify that the minimum full shoulder width is 8 feet when a 7 foot paved shoulder is required. We also added note number 8 to this table stating that a 13 and a half foot full shoulder width with 6 feet of it paved is required in or within 1 mile of an urban area. So for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, what quiet zones are, let me tell you a little bit about them. The Code of Federal Regulations, Part 222, the CFR, defines quiet zone as a segment of rail line within which is situated one or a number of consecutive public highway rail crossings at which locomotive horns are not routinely sounded. If you're interested in learning more about how quiet zones are established, I suggest you go to the website for the CFR and if you want, you can contact us and we can, we can give you the web address. But this site has extensive information regarding what quiet zones are, the minimum length of a quiet zone, who can establish a quiet zone, and much more. So due to the increasing number of quiet zone crossings that are popping up throughout the state, we added this section to Chapter 6 of Volume 1 to provide criteria on crossings within a quiet zone. The CFR that governs quiet zones provides details on approved safety measures to use at quiet zone crossings, but we wanted to provide further details beyond the CFR. As an example, the CFR provides a safety measure of median channelization, which includes temporary channelization such as flexible delineators. We didn't feel that this was a desirable alternative, though, and um, this is reflected in the language included in section 6.2.3 of the PPM. If you have an at-grade rail crossing within the limits of your project and you're not sure if it's within a quiet zone, you should probably contact your district rail office and they'll be able to tell you. Okay, Chapter 8 of Volume 1 is a chapter dedicated to pedestrian, bicycle, and transit facilities. We updated Section 8.3.3.1 of this chapter, which is crosswalks at intersections to include some specific language for special emphasis crosswalk markings and standard crosswalk markings. The direction in this section now states that special emphasis crosswalks are to be used at signalized intersections on all approaches, mid-block crossings, and school crossings. Standard crosswalk markings for stop or yield control intersections are to be used where uh, pedestrian facilities are present. Still within Chapter 8 here, uh, Section 8.4.2.2 was updated to provide some leniency in the criteria to install green bike lanes. Now green bike lanes can be permitted at any of the following areas where the speed limit is greater than 35 miles per hour, uh, where the bike lane crosses a right turn lane, traffic and channelized right turn lane crosses a bike lane, the bike lane is adjacent to a dedicated bus bay, or where a bike lane transitions across a free flow merge lane or lane addition, such as at an interchange. You will still need to get approval from the district design engineer to install green bike lanes, but you no longer have to meet the crash data or observe conflicts criteria. All right, each year, the state safety office updates the crash cost values based on DOT data and the most recent crash data provided by the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles. This information is typically used in the benefit cost analyses that are included with design exception packages. So in Chapter 23 of Volume 1, which is the chapter on design exceptions, the crash cost data tables, uh, tables number 23.5.1 through 23.5.4, have been updated based on the values uh, that we got from the State Safety Office. This year, in addition to updating the crash cost data tables, a new table was added. And this table is for the Highway Safety Manual calibration factors. For those of you who may not be as familiar with the Highway Safety Manual, it's an AASHTO manual that includes equations that are 
st they statistically predict the number of crashes on certain facility types with specific geometric features and traffic volumes. Since these equations are based on nationwide data, they need to be adjusted to be Florida specific. And that's what the calibration factors shown here in this table, uh, table 25.5.3, are used for. If you'd like to learn more about Highway Safety Manual, um, please visit the website shown on this slide. All right, the 2011 AASHTO Green Book revised the K values for crest vertical curves. And the major change was the object height used in the calculation for stopping sight distance. So prior to 2011, AASHTO used an object height of six inches. However, in the 2011 Green Book, AASHTO updated their values using an object height of two feet. This was based on national research and DOT has chosen, chosen to adopt the K values that correspond with the six inch object height for 3R projects. For new construction, we are remaining conservative by staying with an object height of six inches. So there's no change in the K values for new construction, only for 3R projects. All right, and this concludes the discussion of volume one. So now we'll move on to volume two. So in volume two, we combined, reorganized, and cleaned up chapters three and 30. It made sense to move the signature sheet information from chapter 30 into chapter 3 since it follows the key sheet in the plan set. You'll probably notice that a lot of the text for the key sheet was moved or slightly revised. But for now, the only requirement that actually changed was the scale bar, which is now optional. On the next slide, I'll discuss some of the changes that were made to the key sheet exhibit. The signature sheet requirements had a few minor changes. In the case where there is only one professional of record for a plan set, we had previously allowed the key sheet to be digitally signed and sealed. This is no longer the case. We updated the language to state that a signature sheet is required for all contract plan sets, even when there's only one professional of record. And this was done for consistency and also to make sure we included the proper notes that are required by the board. Also, we clarified what to place in the title block of the signature sheet. We'd received a lot of questions about what to put in the space where the professional record information normally goes, so we added some language to address this. The name that appears in the title block needs to be the EOR who is designated on the key sheet. All right, there were several updates to the key sheet, which is exhibit KS1 in chapter three of volume two. One of the first things you may notice is the lack of a scale bar on this sheet. This is a stepping stone to more changes that will be coming soon. In the near future, we'll, we will be moving to a GIS-based location map rather than the current microstation version. Um, so look forward to that. We also removed all of the revisions that were shown on this exhibit, and they're now all illustrated on the new KS2 exhibit we decided to create a new key sheet exhibit so that we could show an example of a new clean key sheet with no revisions and also a key sheet with revisions. Another thing I'd like to note, and it's not necessarily depicted on this particular sheet, is flagging the limits of bridges. In the 2015 PPM, the language within Chapter 3 told us to station and flag the begin and end of proposed bridges. We questioned why this was only required for proposed bridges and not all bridges. So now the language in the text is more clear and it tells us to flag and station the begin and end limits of bridges and bridge culverts. And it goes on to say that if an existing structure is being replaced, we need to label the proposed structure rather than the existing structure. All right, previously the PPM discussed placing aerials and plans in three different locations and the requirement for DDE approval to use aerials and plans was inconsistent. In Volume 2, Chapter 1, the PPM stated that aerials may be included in the plans when approved by the district design engineer. In Chapter 5, it required that aerials be used to uh, develop the drainage maps. And in Chapter 28, aerials are specifically not to be placed in the plans, but are to be delivered to the resident engineer. 
So the 2016 PPM, uh, we've updated it to provide some consistency for the treatment of aerials and plan sets. So chapter one still requires that the district design engineer approve the use of aerial photography and plans, but we added a sentence to clarify that there is no approval necessary for using aerials for drainage maps or SWPPP supplemental site maps. Chapter five was slightly modified to make the use of aerials and drainage maps optional. Where this was previously a shall condition, it's now a may. And chapter 28 was also modified to allow the option of using aerials in the supplemental site maps in the SWPPP sheets. So now aerials are optional for drainage maps and SWPPP sheets. And if you'd like to use them on plan sheets, you'll still need to get the approval of the district design engineer. Some of the recent updates to Chapter 7 of Volume 2 include the addition of language to allow summary of quantity sheets to be numbered SQ1, SQ2, SQ3, and so on. This will provide the opportunity to have multiple summary of quantity sheets and to add more sheets later on without having to renumber the entire rest of the plan set. We've also specified that the shapefiles, calculations, and other documentation that support the quantities shown in the summary boxes be included with the phase submittals beginning with phase three. You may also notice a new subsection in chapter seven. We move the standard notes from the old exhibit 7-1 to a couple of new subsections, uh, 7.2.1 for standard notes and 7.2.2 for pay item notes. And you may also notice that some of the notes that were included in 2015 as pay item notes have been removed. This is because these notes are now covered in the standard specification and we want to avoid duplication of information and the potential for conflicting information. And we also redesigned exhibit uh, SQ1 to provide an example of a summary of quantity sheets and pay item notes. All the other 2015 PPM summary of quantities exhibits have been removed. In Volume 2 of the 2015 PPM last year, project notes were addressed in two separate locations, Chapter 9 and Chapter 10. In the 2016 PPM, we combined these two sections and placed them in one location within Chapter 10. Section 10.4 discusses what project notes are and where to place them. The current requirements in the PPM say to place project notes on the left portion of the first plan profile sheet. but if the project notes don't fit reasonably well on the plan profile sheet, then you have the option to create a separate project notes plan sheet. I should note that project notes are no longer allowed to be placed on project layout sheet, though. We've also added a new subsection 10.4.1 that requires a certified survey of the as-built bridge clearance for projects that propose a minimum design vertical clearance between 16 foot 0 inches and 16 foot 2 inches. Since a design vertical clearance in this range is so close to the minimum allowable value, we want to verify that the tolerance is met once the project is completed. And we also updated exhibit PN1 and moved it from where it was located last year in chapter 9 and placed it in chapter 10. And finally in chapter 23 of volume 2, we removed the language related to separate thermoplastic contracts. Thermoplastic pavement markings will now be included in construction contracts. This revision impacted section 23.1 and completely removed the old section 23.10. So that concludes this presentation on volumes one and two, with the exception of chapters four and seven, which we'll cover in a few minutes. For now, we'll go ahead and take a few questions. Okay, um, thank you, Mary Jane. Um, this is Paul again. I, I want to answer a couple questions about playing language before Derwood takes over. So um, there was a question about playing language being applied to project notes. Um, this is an ongoing conversation here in the central office about how we're constructing our notes. Um, the notes that are contained in the plans is direction to the contractor the same as all the information contained in the plans or direction to the contractor unless otherwise specified. 
So our notes should be written um, directive, and they should be active. Um, and so they should um, they should be written in this plain language um, format. And so we're talking how to best uh, perhaps um, put together some training or some guidance on how to properly construct project notes based on plain language. Um, that's in the early stages of conversation up here, but we are thinking we're moving in that direction. Um, another question I got was, um, is the shall a legal term? Um, and, it, and shall has been a legal term for many, many years, but if you go in and Google shall versus must, you'll see a lot of court cases where the use of shall was contested and lost. And so it's, it's one of the reasons why our federal government has now gone to this term must. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it holds up in court. It's less, you're less able to challenge it. It's more direct on the intent of the sentence that contains it. Um, so that is the reason our federal government went. That is the reason we're adopting it for our manuals. Um, the other thing I'll point out is as we get into directive and active language, as Mary Jane pointed out earlier, that must, 90% of the time when we rewrite that sentence, goes away. It's directive language to the, to the designer, the person in charge of the plans or documents. And so that must goes away. We just direct them to do a certain thing that's required. And so that must actually, or the shall and the must, act will go away as we implement, probably 90, 95% of the time. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Sherwood, and we'll come back to the PPM questions. I see a few rolling in. We'll come back to that. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, so I'm going to talk about the uh, Chapter 4 changes to Volume 1 of the PPM, the Roadside Safety Chapter. Um, we, uh, we made a number of modifications to this chapter, which I'll talk about in the preceding slides. Um, but just wanted to start out with kind of what we, how we define the roadside in terms of Chapter 4. And as you can see in these two little graphics, um, basically... Um, on a flush shoulder roadway, we're talking about everything that's outside of the shoulder, so shoulder widths um, and, and the cross slopes are all still covered um, within Chapter 2 of the PPM, but everything outside of that and including curbs, um, slopes, clear zone widths, traffic barrier, barriers, etc. will be covered within Chapter 4. Um, just to kind of highlight the implementation letter for the PPM, all of the significant changes and additions to Chapter 4 are covered in the bulletin on pages um, 3 through 6. And so we'll just talk about kind of what we did. Like I said, we re redeveloped and reorganized the entire chapter. It was basically a consolidation effort of all the roadside safety design elements that existed throughout the PPM already, which included information in these chapters um, 2, 7, 10, 21, and 25, where um, for instance, lateral offset information, clear zone information, um, barrier information was scattered throughout the, the PPM. So um, along with the consolidation effort, it was also to try and create a little bit more comprehensive criteria with some of the areas that we were always getting questions about. Um, you know, those included adding some new sections to prevent confusion um, and then also trying to supplement some of the existing criteria. Um, Along with that, also had to deal with the roadside design guide and, and where appropriate, sending designers to the to the requirements that are included within that document. So we there, there's some added places where we're referring to the roadside design guide, um, and then like I say, add, adding the new sections, adding the general section, and some of these others that we'll go through here in the next slides. Um, the general section, um, you know. Most of the chapters in the PPM have a general section just to let you kind of know what the terms of the chapter are. But one of the important sections here was just trying to highlight that since we're bringing in new construction, triple R criteria and, and TDLC criteria is just making sure that up front in the chapter that everybody understands um, how to apply triple R criteria and TDLC criteria within the chapter. Um, we added in specific roadside slope classifications. Before these were kind of, you kind of had to infer exactly what each one of these uh, slope classifications, what the definitions of them were. So we added that just for clarity. Uh, when it comes to the clear zone concept, um, we added in a, a basic concept and renamed the original concept that was shown in there as the adjusted clear zone. And basically trying to avoid 
and eliminate the confusion between um, what the actual clear zone width and requirements are for slope versus what an acceptable adjustment is. And that adjustment would only be done based on site specific needs. Um, but you know the intent is that you're providing this basic concept at all time. Um, one of the other efforts was to consolidate all the clear zone requirement widths. Uh, this was you know, previously referred to in chapters 2, 21, and 25 as recoverable terrain. Um, but we're trying to, as you can see on the previous slide, um, you know, define everything in terms of the clear zone width. If you have to add additional runout areas or traversable slopes for the adjusted, you're still adding up to what the clear zone width requirement is. Um, we also moved in a table to represent the work zone, clear zones, um, that is in index 600. This is kind of just preemptive to some of the work that will be done in the future um, as it relates to, to work zone design and, and temporary traffic control plans. Um, like I said, lateral offsets, you know, we consolidated all the information from the various chapters. Um, you, know, you know, lateral offset is essentially an exception to clear zone for elements that are considered functionally necessary for normal operations of the roadway. So, you know, you're supposed to provide clear zone wherever possible, but in realizing that in urban areas that don't have sufficient right of way um, to provide the clear zone widths, we're providing these minimum lateral offsets in those locations. Um, we also added kind of a general statement within a lot of offsets about um, elements that are placed behind barrier that are justified for other reasons. Um, previously, we had little notes throughout the lateral offset um, data tables that, that alluded to this, but it's kind of a general statement that applies to any element, that as long as you're behind the, the setback and deflection distance of the barrier, that um, you can put something that's not crashworthy behind it. Um, as long as that barrier was there and justified for other reasons. So we don't want to be putting things close to the right of way or close to the, the travel way um, if, if it's not justified for other reasons. Um, so just kind of give you a preview of what the lateral offset criteria tables look like now. You know, created this matrix that combined the new construction lateral offset criteria, the triple R, TDLC, and then all other is basically um, your high speed limited access facilities. Um, you know, all of all of these parameters in here are for um, design speeds less than or equal to 45 mile per hour for curb sections in urban areas. Um, the you know, I just say that the offset and the in, or the offsets and the intent of lateral offsets did not change. It's just a consolidation of all that information in one location. Um, Following that roadside slope criteria, we moved the, the table from Chapter 2 into Chapter 4. Um, the triple R slope criteria, we did remove some of the overlapping new construction criteria. As you can see on what I redlined here, um, essentially we've told you at the beginning of the chapter what your obligations are in a triple R project and how that relates to new construction criteria. So we're not duplicating that priority list here, we're just telling you what the triple R criteria is, but you're supposed to provide new construction where possible. Um, added a more comprehensive drainage feature section. Um, this was to provide some clarity between what the relationship between drainage features and the roadside is. Um, for instance, roadside ditches, uh, we, we did redraw these figures from the previous chapter, but it was mainly just to provide some consistency along the chapter and how, how we how we show things and you know stylistically, um, but we did reword things to make sure that it's clear that these tables are only intended to be used when you've you've uh, received approval from the district drainage engineer to violate the minimum five foot width requirement per the drainage manual. So you know these just provide what an acceptable option is, an acceptable traversable option is, um, if there's a change that is granted by the drainage engineer. Um, additionally, we consolidated the curbs information. Um, again, there was information in chapters 2, 4, and 25 that was virtually all written the exact same way. Um, so we just wanted to, to centralize that information and not have it spread amongst different chapters. Um, added a reference to the drainage manual for the requirements of shoulder gutter. Uh, we also updated the allowances for curbs on higher speed facilities. This is just kind of to 
take into account some of the newer um, design policies. Nothing, nothing has really changed in intent there. Um, finally, we added a drainage structure section, uh, basically trying to emphasize the importance of traversable drainage inlets within the clear zone, also in treatments. Um, basically, if it's not a traversable design, then we want it located outside of the clear zone. As a companion to this information, there's also a new table added to the drainage manual that actually segments out every standard inlet and in treatment design that's in our design standards and and categorizes it as whether or not it's acceptable within the clear zone or not to help to help designers make that decision um, we also added in a, a triple R section um, it's always been a little bit ambiguous about what the the department's exact policy was on triple R projects and when to relocate stuff. We had some information in our practical design guides, um, but um, this is just to kind of reaffirm exactly what the intent is. And basically, we're we're following our our criteria for other objects when they've been impacted three times in five years, um, but also reinforcing that if you're adding new drainage structures on a triple R project, they should meet new construction criteria. Um, traffic separators was another section that was added. This was basically to again provide kind of a a, a location for um, the documents that are out there that dictate when traffic separators are to be used and not. Um, you know, we we have index 302. There's information in the Florida Intersection Design Guide that really goes into when traffic separators are needed, but there was nothing in the PPM previously to help direct people to that criteria. Um, for signing, lighting, traffic signals, and other roadside features, um, this is basically um, the old roadside appurtenances section in Chapter 4, that, but it only covered sign support, so we were trying to expand this to make sure that we covered all of the roadside elements covered in Chapter 7 as traffic signals and lighting. Um, also added a roadside flashing beacons section. This was kind of previously covered in Chapter 7 as electronic display signs, but essentially um, that's just to make sure that everyone understands what, what we were referring to previously, consolidated into the right chapter, um, and reference the appropriate indexes that tell you where those devices can be um, located and what their assemblies look like. Um, for breakaway devices, uh, this was also another little section that was oddly located within the previous Chapter 4 as location criteria, but basically we wanted to make sure that everyone understood what the criteria for breakaway supports was, where to go find that in the roadside design guide, um, and that where those breakaway devices are allowed to be placed so that um, they're, they're impacted in the right conditions to allow them to perform the way they're supposed to. Um, the next section of the chapter is uh, the roadside hazards. Um, previously, we only really covered canal hazards and drop-offs, so we kind of expanded this a little bit. Um, again, just basic above-ground hazard definition was, was actually located in Chapter 10 before, so we relocated that here. Um, essentially, you're talking about anything that's four inches in height above the ground and is unyielding or does not meet the breakaway requirements um, of this section. Um, curbs do not are not considered as an above ground hazard. So, just a couple of tidbits I wanted to make sure that y'all are all aware of. Um, additionally, uh, for canal hazards, uh, we made a couple of minor updates here. One of them was, you know, previously there was kind of a large paragraph that tried to explain what these different conditions were for the offset criteria in the different speed and um, urban or, or rural type sections, so we just kind of try to simplify those in bullets. Um, but also revising the barrier placement requirements slightly. Um, previously the criteria kind of read that specifically if you met the, the canal hazard um, definition, then you had to place barrier at very specific locations from the top slope of the um, canal hazard, but really we want to make sure that we're giving designers the latitude to make sure that if there are other hazards in between the traveled way and that 
canal hazard that they have the latitude to adjust that location. So basically, um, when we're protecting these types of locations, we, we at least want to try to make sure that the barrier is placed outside of the clear zone um, and then no closer than the offsets that were provided previously. For drop-off hazards, um, uh, we kind of removed the, the previous language about the shielding criteria because you know, as we laid out this new chapter, we're trying to go from you know, in a more of a, a logical order about you know, what is the roadside, what are the definitions, what are the hazards, what are the barrier type selections, and then, then what is the shielding criteria. So we kind of removed that from this section for now. Um, we added in vertical phase structures since um, those do not meet the traversability requirements for a clear zone, so we're just trying to make that clear. Um, and then we also added in the, the drop-off and work zones information from Chapter 10. Um, one last section that we added in to the roadside hazards section was just this kind of kind of a catch-all additional hazards considerations. But what was really needed here was just to try and direct information about those hazards that may be um, dangerous for people other than the motorists. You know, a lot of this chapter is about the traveling public on the road, but there are certain instances where we're trying to provide protection for things other than motorists. You know, such as peer protection where um, where it's needed more so to make sure that we are supporting our infrastructure and, and not um, having um, bridge foundations that could be subject to uh, to failure. Um, and then also positive protection work zones <clears throat> is another instance of that, that we have some added sections to cover those two things. Um, next we go into a section, like I said, um, we've added in this longitudinal barriers, barrier transitions, in treatments, and crash cushion section. Um, this was to try and provide um, information to the designers about what the testing requirements and performance levels of the various standard roadside hardware. Um, one thing you'll kind of see throughout here is trying to make sure that designers understand the importance of um, the crashworthiness of these different devices and that um, non-standard hardware modifications to hardware or barriers um, those those changes need to be approved through either the structures design office or the roadway design office um, and then also here at the bottom I was just highlighting kind of the outline of the section but we'll go through these a little bit more in detail um, for standard longitudinal barriers uh, we're providing the the kind of industry definition for what our different barrier types are flexible barrier semi rigid barrier rigid barrier um, Right now, high tension cable barrier is the only flexible barrier out there. Uh, semi rigid barrier is your W beam guardrail covered by index 400. That's our new 31 inch system with lap splices at the mid span. Also, want to make sure that uh, you know a lot of questions we always got about what what the minimum length for a barrier or guardrail installation truly was, and based on this new system uh, for 31 inch height and lap splices um, testing right now suggests that the minimum length should be 75 feet. Uh, modified thriving guardrails also considered a semi-rigid barrier is covered in index 400 uh, and just want to highlight that the thriving guardrail as a standard run has been removed as an option essentially a standard run of thriving um, from a, a crash worthy standpoint does not provide a performance level any higher than a W-beam shape. Um, in addition to that, as we're transitioning from our current NCHRP 350 tested hardware to MASH tested hardware, uh, Thrybeam guardrail in its current configuration as, or as previously detailed in our standards will not meet MASH, so we're just trying to kind of preemptively, based on those two facts, we're going ahead and removing that as an option. For our rigid barrier, that's basically our, our cast in place, concrete barrier, medium barriers, and shoulder barriers, and then our, our traffic railings, our bridge rails, and the rails that are, are mounted on top of MSE walls. Again, modifications to any of these rigid barriers must be approved by either the RDO or the SDO. Uh, we've seen a lot of installations recently, and I think we're even going to have a session at the um, Design Expo during the summer about these types of modifications to rigid barrier. We've seen a lot of interesting things out there and, and they're not crashworthy. So we, we're trying to get ahead of that. 
finally in this section is, a, is temporary barriers, just trying to cover the different options and what the criteria for them are. For low profile barriers, you know, those are required for any work zones less than or equal to 45 mile per hour when they're within 100 feet of an intersection, residential driveway, or business entrance. It's essentially what we want in urban areas with low design speeds to make sure that we have adequate sight distance and we're not impeding on you know the business aspects or the, the sight distance issues. Um, we also put a limitation on transitioning from low profile to other barrier types and finally mentioning that any any flexible or semi-rigid barriers again our, our cable barrier systems or our W beam guardrail that if they are used in a temporary condition that that temporary condition must meet the requirements for a permanent installation and that deals with the grading deflections place offset there there are no temporary allowances for deviations from that when they're placed within the temporary work zone. In treatments, um, we're trying to again just provide the the definitions of these terms for, for criteria purposes. Uh, the approach terminals are, are all proprietary devices listed on APL and they consist of flared parallel and a, and a new category that we're calling double-faced. This is essentially to try and and you know, previously in the design standards, anywhere there were was double phase guardrail shown, it was pretty much always shown as a crash cushion. And so there's been kind of this this thought by by designers that well, it's either a crash cushion or I can get it out of the clear zone and put a trailing in. And what the preferred option is is that there are double faced in terminals that are a better solution. And so we're just trying to make sure that through this kind of classification process that we're, we're getting that point across. Um, you know, as in treatments could still be a crash cushion in the right situation, and then also we have our trailing in anchorages, which we refer to as type two in the standards, which again is only permitted when it's outside the clear zone of opposing lanes of traffic. For uh, rigid barrier in treatments, the the transitions or preferences are transitioning to another type of barrier, for example, guardrail, or placing a crash cushion on it. The tapered in sections are still shown in the standards, but you know, we can't express enough that those types of transitions are, are it's not really covered as an option in the PPM because they should only be used under when absolutely necessary due to you know, some constrained conditions. Uh, treatment of the trailing end of a ridge barrier again is only needed if, the, if it's outside of the clear zone of opposing lanes of traffic. For temporary barrier ends, this information was just carried over from Chapter 10. Nothing, nothing really changed there. For crash cushions, again, no significant change between permanent and temporary. Um, I did highlight this aspect about not located behind curbs. That's been part of the criteria in the PPM for some time, but it seems to be overlooked, and we're, we continue to see crash cushions installed on top of or behind curbs. Um, and I just highlight that classification for crash cushions is something that we're, we're still looking at and working on. We want to make sure that designers have the right tools to select appropriate types of crash cushions, whether that be for ma low maintenance purposes or high impact locations, or maybe it's a location where there's very low expectation that it would be hit, but we want to make sure that it's a crash worthy device. Um, for gating types of temporary crash cushions, the only thing that was added in was that those types of gating crash cushions are only permitted when approved by the state roadway design office. Basically these gating types of cushions don't provide redirective capacity at the face of the device, so um, there's only limited circumstances where we would really want to see these types of devices because you have to provide a, a high runout area behind these devices so it's, it's they're not the most practical from a, a standard point of view um, but it is an option we just want to make sure that um, that we've had a chance to evaluate them before they're deployed on projects. Um, we, we added in a barrier transition section again just for completeness uh, nothing nothing earth-shattering here like I say we're just listing the standard types of, of barrier transitions that are included within our standards. Uh, so from there we roll into barrier type selection. 
basically trying to consolidate some of the information that was located very early on in the original chapter four and, and like I say, just providing a little bit better order to it. That this isn't anything that's really new. One thing that we did add for longitudinal barrier selection is that uh, for uh, the SD for traffic railing selection, you need to refer to the structures um, design guide. Um, but then also we added a selection matrix, which I'll show you in just a minute, for trying to kind of assist in the evaluation of alternatives. The crash cushion section uh, for selection. Is, is basically what was previously in Chapter 4, Section 4.5.2. And then also for the selection of, of when to use peer protection, we've added a new flow chart, which I'll show you here. This is the longitudinal barrier selection uh, matrix I was talking about. It's basically showing you all the standard longitudinal barrier types, what the deflection space is, and then this order of bias for what the initial cost, the impact severities, and maintenance costs are. So it's just to try to give designers, you know, a clear or picture of when they're trying to decide which one of these barrier types best suits their project. They know uh, what sort of vehicles that that type of um, barrier is designed to handle, what the deflection requirements are, and and like I say, some relative order of bias. Um, here's the the peer protection flowchart that we added. I will highlight that this is for new construction. But essentially, the same principle holds for triple R, but there are some conditional statements within the structures design guide that, um, you know, again, just kind of try not to be as rigid on triple R projects with understanding that, you know, for instance, if there's no history of crashes at that location, there's provisions within the triple R for, for that type of consideration. Um, so when you are doing triple R, there wasn't an easy way to to create a flow chart to handle all those conditional statements within the SDG, but um, but this is in general the same exact principle for both um, conditions. Uh, for for barrier placement, um, we again the controlling factors when you're looking at barrier placement haven't changed. We did um, try to make sure that the offset requirements were clearly understood. Uh, the, previously, the guardrail offset requirements were in Chapter 2, so we brought those into this section. Also trying to clarify the difference between a setback and an offset. Uh, essentially, if the PPM is referring to offset, we're talking about the offset of the barrier from traffic. And if we're talking about setback, we're talking about the distance behind the barrier to some other object or um, non-crashworthy object. Um, so like I say, we when it comes to... Uh, curb placement for guardrail and other barrier types. We removed the old figure 4.3.1, which you see up here in the top right, and are relying on the guardrail offset figures to, to guide people that way because it's a little bit clearer to understand than the old uh, graph was. Um, speaking of curbs, we've changed the, the, the preference for guardrail offset to be five inches from the face. That that's under current testing requirements that it, not necessarily the best performing, but it just allows a little bit more space for for vehicles who might depart the roadway to to contact the curb without contacting the rail. It also you know in areas where we may have street sweepers or other things like that, it's just a little bit better design. Realizing that in some areas we we may not have that right away. You know, five inches can make all the difference sometimes. So. You know, it, it still can be placed at the face of curb, but we, you know, we would prefer it to be five inches away. Here's a, a look at the figure from that was previously located in Chapter Two. Uh, we just kind of updated it again, just to 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 make everything flow better. One thing that I will add is, uh, you know, for the lateral offset of guardrail. It's, it's basically still the same shoulder width plus two feet, max of 12. Uh, one thing we did want to clarify was that for medians, the intent was that there be an eight foot minimum offset for any median configuration, but that, and that's for median shoulders less than or equal to six foot. So if you had a, a four foot shoulder, it would the guardrail would be at eight foot. If you had a six foot shoulder, it would be at eight foot. And then once you got to eight foot, it would be 
uh, the shoulder width plus two feet. So trying to make sure that that's a little bit more clearly understood. For the setback requirements, we uh, modified the original table that was within here to remove the thrive beam options. You know, again, essentially the difference between a reduced post based to W beam and a reduced post based thrive beam, um, especially under new crash testing standards, the difference in the deflection was 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 basically two to three inches. So we don't see the need to to incur the expense of putting thrive beam out there when you can get very close to that same demand using W beam. We added the high tension cable barrier. Um, so that there's a defined setback distance requirement for those. Um, for rigid barriers, we added in all the setback requirements for those as well, realizing that the setback requirements for these more flexible barriers or semi-rigid barriers, those are based on deflection. And for rigid barriers, these setbacks are, are, are there for what is known as the zone of intrusion, basically um, for vehicles who, who, you know, they're not going to deflect the rail, but they may carry part of that vehicle over the top of the rail. We want to make sure there's not elements there that can contact the cabs or vehicle compartments. Um, we relocated from Chapter 7 the setback distance for discontinuous elements. Uh, this was basically for, for sign attachments, but again, we wanted to make sure that all things dealing with roadside and barriers was located within this chapter now. For, for grading requirements, this is a new section that we added, again, to highlight the importance of grading around these different types of barriers because it's very significant on their performance. Uh, essentially, barriers should be placed with an approach slope of 1 to 10 or flatter, uh, clarifying the two-foot setback requirement for guardrail. So that, that is clearly shown in our new standard consistently and represented within the, the PPN consistently. Uh, also highlighting that the grading details shown in the design standards, for instance, for approach terminals, must be followed and shown in the plans um, adequately. Uh, but then also, one of the things that we kind of noticed a need for was limiting the, uh, the algebraic difference between different uh, slopes, specifically in super-elevated sections. 7% um, is the max allowed for triple R um, criteria anyway, so we shouldn't really be seeing this, but, but in some cases, um, especially for guardrails, the kind of gray area that existed was, was allowing some design build um, contracts to, to put some breakpoints in advance of, of guardrail that we didn't, we weren't, uh, believe would be in a, in a, a manner that the barrier would perform the way it was intended to. So, so we've clarified that. Uh, we've also added a length of need section. This section will get expanded as we redevelop all of our longitudinal barrier indexes. Uh, for now, basically that section is just referring to the specific design standard or the IDS for each barrier type, but essentially we will be transitioning to the AASHTO roadside design guide calculation method. This Screenshot here is actually from the the DSR information that went out for the new index 400, and this is located within the uh, Excel um, design calculation program that we developed. So I was just trying to exhibit what that calculation method is. It's it's simple ge uh, geometry, but um, we've created some design tools just to make sure that that uh, it's clearly understood and applied. For median barriers, this section is intended primarily to cover the barriers that are placed to prevent crossover collisions and through medians, uh, but we also are relying on the median barrier placement guidelines that are located within the AASHTO Roadside Design Guide Section 6.6. .6. Below here you can see that uh, this little cutout, it's not the entire illustration, from the roadside design guide figure 6-1 or figure dash figure 6-18 which is the recommended barrier placement and on lawn level medians but this is basically what the department has accepted as our criteria for establishing proper barrier placement within a median um, and then I also wanted to highlight that 
the the preferred option for median barrier is high tension cable barrier. Finally, uh, well, I say finally, um, but for barrier placement, uh, the last part here is considerations for placement of temporary barrier. This is combining information from Chapter 10. Uh, some of the the changes was adding a refuge area requirement, and this is for projects that have barriers located on both sides of the traveled way where you're essentially not providing any refuge area or shoulder width. Uh, this, was, this was done for multiple reasons, one of them primarily being emergency vehicle access when there is incidences through a work zone. Um, essentially there's some projects where we're seeing barrier placed you know, two feet from the travel lane on either side and in times where there's an incident there's no way to move vehicles through that work zone. Um, also, I wanted to highlight that uh, using, again, using existing permanent barriers during a TTC phase, that, that barrier must meet the grading, offset, and setback requirements for the permanent installation. Um, from this, we go into a warrants for roadside barrier section. This was, this was previously in Chapter 4. Nothing has really changed here. Just wanted to highlight a few things, and that's that um, you know, just always keep in mind that barriers present a hazard in and of themselves. So, you know, we want to make sure that that when we place a barrier there, that it is justified, and that justification should be done um, either through an RSAP analysis or using the Ashto Highway Safety Manual guidelines. And and that's been a part of the PPM and is covered in Section 23.5. Uh, what we're, I'm showing here is just some of the sections that we've relocated. Um, throughout, which is including the evaluation of roadside hardware, shielding requirements, warrants for median barrier, and positive protection work zones. So in a little bit more detail, uh, the, the warrants for the roadside barrier, again, this is still uh, very much a, a process where it requires a lot of engineering judgment, um, but we're including all the items that we consider to be particularly more harmful than uh, a barrier would be. So that's what the shielding requirements covered in section 4.4.7.2 which was previously the first section in chapter 4 but these highlight what the actual requirements are when you're making the decision to, to place barrier or not and so that's this, this list of priority about whether or not you're going to eliminate the hazard, shield it, or leave it unshielded and what the requirements are for each one of those. The warrants for median barrier, we, we added this as a separate section. Uh, one of the additions here was based on a mandate from Federal Highway to have a written policy on when to provide median barriers for non-limited access facilities that are high speed, high volume. Uh, essentially, we're using the same type of methodology that we look at for our interstate and expressway facilities, but with consideration that you may have, based on that type of facility, you may have some alignment issues or site distance issues, um, a, a lot of median open openings that just don't uh, have a good fit for using the median barrier. So again, uh, engineering judgment, but there there had to be a written policy on it. So it's not it's not a real strict policy on when to place it, but making sure that designers are aware that they have to look at it. For attachments to barriers, this is uh, section 4.5. A lot of this information was relocated from Chapter 7. Uh, we've added a statement that, that attachments to flexible and semi-rigid barriers are not permitted. Uh, for, for the design of these types of attachments, that information is included within the Structures Design Guide. Um, but essentially, there are specific design standard indexes which cover the allowable attachments that's index 17515 for lighting. Index 410 has acceptable um, sign foundation attachments that are uh, permissible. And then index 11871 for, for signs that are permitted on median barriers. Uh, there, there still is a, a portion in, in section 7.25 of chapter 7 which lists the signs that are permitted to be used with index 11871. 
Um, so I just wanted to highlight that fact. Um, for existing attachments, essentially if there's an existing attachment on a project, if it doesn't meet the requirements of those three indexes, then it's to be removed and replaced. For temporary attachments, again, there, there's allowance for using index 11871 when, when the post cannot be mounted outside of a, of a barrier location and there's still a section in chapter 10 governing the requirements for temporary lighting in work zones. So I just wanted to highlight those. Section 4.6, surface treatment. This is uh, has remained unchanged from the previous section, 4.3.7. Upgrading existing barriers. This was a part of the old Chapter 4. Uh, one thing that we did add to it was provision that when, when there are uh, any existing roadside hardware devices that are found not to comply with at least NCHRP 350, we want to make sure that we are replacing all of those devices moving forward. Um, and then also uh, we relocated the information about all of the existing barrier options from Chapter 25 into Chapter 4. For resetting of guardrail, uh, we, we tried to provide a little bit better definition in the con conditions for what resetting of guardrail is and that the requirements for that are to reset it to the new mounting height and splice location shown in the current standards and that may have some ramifications on whether or not um, that, that run of guardrail might have to be lengthened slightly when you, when you adjust that mounting location and you're essentially sliding the rail down half a post spacing so that, that could have some effects. We need to look for that. For all of the triple R requirements that were previously located in Chapter 25, that those have been relocated here with generally no significant changes except that try to just clean up the language a little bit. Previously we referenced a lot about the 2013 design standards and essentially what we were talking about is the old 27 inch guardrail. So instead of saying 2013 design standards everywhere, we define 27 inch guardrail as at least meeting the requirements of the 2013 design standards and then just refer to it as 27 inch guardrail from there on throughout the, this section. Um, again, added a, a section in here about existing Thrive Beam, like I mentioned previously, that's being removed as a new installation alternative. But since it did meet NCHRP 350, existing Thrive Beam installations um, can still be left in place. We just don't want to see any extension of those devices um, or, or that barrier type. Um, also, want to add that you know we still see some of the old steel offset blocks out there that has been retested under 350 and is acceptable for lower speeds so we don't have to replace those in all conditions unless it's a higher speed facility. Um, we just kind of renamed the previous section that only covered guardrail terminals to cover all types of end treatments. Um, the bridge rail traffic section in chapter 29 has been um, relocated along with the guardrail to bridge rail transitions. Uh, the only thing we removed here was the old guardrail continuous across bridges. This was this was kind of grandfathered in previously under some old um, guidelines, but it wasn't crash tested, and we know that it won't meet um, new crash requirements going forward. So we're we're removing that as as an option. There is allowances still for leaving it in section 4.7.4, but. Um, we've, we've removed index 403, which used to govern this, so we've removed it as a condition within that section. Um, finally, for non-standard roadway hardware, again, just want to highlight that any time that we have uh, devices that maybe they have gone through crash testing requirements and they have letters but they're not included on the APL or within the design standards, uh, we just want to make sure that those type of devices are approved through um, the appropriate offices um, at central office before they're deployed on a project. So that is my review of the changes for Chapter 4. Thank you, Derwood. Um, at this time, I think we're going to take some questions from Paul and Mary Jane. Okay, thanks, Jackie. Uh, we have a few questions that have rolled in here. Uh, let's see here. 
where can I find examples of each summary box to be included in SQ sheets is the question. And um, basically, you can find these in the CAD menu boxes. Uh, they're available right now. And we're currently working on also getting them into the basis of estimates manual as um, shown as examples. That's a work in progress. It's not out there yet, but it's coming soon. Uh, next question, if a plan specific note is put in the general notes page, can it also be replicated on the applicable plan sheet with an arrow pointing specifically at the device or location to which the note would apply? I would say that it needs to be in one place or the other. If it's a, uh, if it's a project specific note having to do with the entire project, then that needs to go on your project note sheet. Uh, if it's a specific note that you want to address something within the plan sheet, then that's a plan note and just show it in one place or the other, but not both. Uh, Paul, did you want to take this next one? Um, let me see it. Um, construction revision. So when I uh, said so the question is uh, for construction revisions, um, si digitally signing and sealing, where do we place the digital seal? Well, revisions are revisions. Um, so when you're making revisions post let, which is during the construction phase, um, you use the clouding, and that's when you're required to use that to show the revisions. Um, but when you sign and seal, digitally sign and seal that, you're going to create a new, um, a new signature sheet and a new key sheet um, to go along with whatever other pages that you're going to include with that revised submittal, that digitally signed and sealed revised submittal. So the procedure is really the same um, post-let and pre-let. The only difference is, is just the clouding of the revision to indicate it was post-let. Okay. okay, I just wanted to address some of the questions that came in from the Chapter 4 uh, discussion. Um, essentially, um, let's see here, let me scroll back up, move down. Uh, for the, the question about placing crash cushions behind type E mountable curb, that is not a condition in which crash cushions have been evaluated previously, although we recognize that in certain uh, instances where we still have to worry about closed drainage system or different drainage needs that, that still may be necessary, and in those cases, you just have to make sure that you justify and document those needs. That's, that's the most important part. Um, but we want to make sure that these types of devices are installed as they are intended to perform. And so in general, if you can avoid putting that curb there, that, that would be the number one priority. Um, next question was, is there any existing issues with the high tension cable barrier application? And at this time, I would say no. We have we have modified our requirements for high tension cable barrier to go to um, four cable systems now, but the uh, the three cable systems that are out there have been performing well, so we're not looking to to make any adjustments or requirements for uh, relocating or adjusting those systems. Uh, another question had to do with the offset of the curb uh, being five inches for a standard curb and then six inches for open shoulder location uh, or a, kind of a shoulder gutter condition. Uh, the five inches is based specifically on the crash testing that was done of guardrail in combination with a six inch raised curb. And then in the shoulder gutter locations, those were um, laid out based on spread needs for drainage requirements. So we're, we're, we won't be adjusting those. Uh, it, another question was which edition of AASHTO is currently being used by DOT. If that is pertaining to the roadside design guide, that is still the fourth edition for, let's see here, can we include the warrants for roadside barrier when we conduct RSA or road safety audits? Um, if it's if it's based on crash history, I'd say, yeah, sure. There's there's no reason why you can't justify um, placing a barrier when there's there's no room or or possibility of making other roadway uh, design changes. Um, and there's a history of crashes or, or a, a recognition of a problem. Then sure, that that you know, again, it's it's all about 
documenting a problem and justifying it and make sure that that's all um, placed in the adequate locations. Um, next question, why is it not permitted to extend Thrybeam? Again, uh, we already know that Thrybeam will not meet MASH requirements um, as it's currently uh, detailed in our design standards. Um, so if we're going to be extending a Thrybeam installation, then it just needs to be transitioned to uh, W-Beam at the current standard that's, that's easy to accomplish with the, with the asymmetric um, panels that are available within the design standard. Um, again, that's, that, that ties into part of the MASH implementation process and the fact that new installations um, won't be permitted if they don't meet MASH. So we're kind of being a little preemptive on that ahead of what the implementation agreement said, but we're just moving forward with that. Um, next question was, will attenuators that do not meet NCHRP 350 be required to be upgraded? Answer is yes. Um, there's another question here regarding the guardrail setback to slope break and that there seems to be inconsistency between the required two-foot setback and the dimension shown in Chapter 2, Table 2.3.1. The, the differences there have to do with um, the location of the shoulder gutter and the okay, the location of the shoulder gutter and what the setback requirements are from from that for the spread calculations. Like I said before, there are some adjustments that need, do need to be made within the shoulder gutter or, or, the, or the shoulder requirements table, and we, we will be looking at those in the near future. Um, from here, I'll send it over to Chester to do his discussion on Chapter 7. Good morning. I'm Chester Henson from the State Roadway Design Office. I'll be discussing some of the changes to plans preparation manual for Chapter 7. Now, I'll just be going over some of the major changes we've done in Chapter 7, but Chapter 7 has been totally rewritten from the previous PPM update. So if you work with, if you're a designer working with Chapter 7, it would be beneficial for you to go through the whole chapter and look at the differences in, in what has changed. This morning I would like to go over a couple of the two of the major areas that we've changed. One is section 7.3 in lighting and the other one is section 7.6 on pavement markings. Okay, in 7.3 uh, there was a table in here, section 7.3.1. That design criteria has not changed. So the light levels, the uniformity, the max to min ratios, the average to min ratios are still basically the same. But we have added some tables for uh, new tables for specific intersection uh, pedestrian lighting at intersections, uh, a table in there for mid block crosswalks. So there's a couple of new tables that have been added. <clears throat> in chapter seven, we have changed, it now requires us of specific methodology for our light calculations so that we can have consistency in our lighting design. Uh, the old chapter 7.3 did not spell out any specific type of calculations. A lot of designers were using the uh, polygon method, but a lot of them were using uh, the IS, ISNA report number eight, but we've now spelled out our, method, our methodology that's going to be required. And that will be the polygon method, and, it's, and it also establishes analysis zones for each polygon. Section 7.3.2 establishes specific limits for various analysis zones on flush holder facilities, curb and gutter facilities, and freeway facilities. So all of the analysis zones are, are very specific now in sections 7.3. Previously, intersections were considered just part of the roadway analysis. Now we have separated them into two independent analysis zones. Our lighting criteria will be the same for the roadway, but now the signalized intersections will have 
to meet the same criteria. So for the roadway, if you're using a conventional roadway, the average luminous intensity was 1.5 foot candles. Now then, the intersections will be held to that same foot candle requirement. This is the old methodology created intersections with low levels of illumination and did not consider lighting requirements on the crossroad that signalized the intersection. This is a rendering that we developed uh, indicating the light levels at intersections where basically you had lighting on the mainline roadway and no lighting on the crossroad. You can see the intersection tends to be the darkest part of the roadway and basically there's really no lighting at all uh, on the crossroad. For new intersections or reconstructed intersections in urban three areas, and let me explain a little bit what an urban three area is. Uh, the RCI designates urban three areas as cities with populations of 250,000 or greater. So if you've got a new intersection or a reconstructed intersection in an urban three area, our methodology will consider not only the horizontal illumination of the intersection, but the pedestrian illumination. So we have, this is one of the new tables that has been added, it's table 7.3.3. Um, you'll notice that the horizontal foot candle requirement uh, normally, which would be for an, a regular intersection, would be 1.5. You notice that here it's 3.0. Um, that 3.0 is really more of what happens with trying to provide pedestrian lighting and what you might end up with as far as horizontal illumination in the intersection. So that 3.0 will not be a, a difficult value to achieve. Now, you notice that the table also requires a vertical illumination requirement. And the value we have for that is 2.3 foot candles. Um, and chapter seven spells out exactly how the vertical illumination is to be calculated. Uh, so if you're not familiar with vertical illumination, chapter seven or section 7.3 will give you a good idea of how it's to be done. Now, along with just the intersection, we are looking at a specific methodology which requires the designer to evaluate the vertical illumination on, on crosswalks. The first one we want analyzed is called the near side approach to crosswalks. So in this particular case, you'd be looking at vehicles approaching the, the near side crosswalk and meeting that vertical illumination requirement. Uh, we also want designers to evaluate the vertical illumination on right turn cross to crosswalks on both the mainline roadway and the cross road, roadway. So if you're making a right turn here, we would be analyzing the vertical illumination on this particular crosswalk. <clears throat> We also require the designers to evaluate the vertical illumination on left turns to crossroads on both the main line and the cross roadway. So for this approach, the left turn, you'd be evaluating the vertical illumination in this portion of the crosswalk on the cross roadway. So for an intersection, you would, depending on whether it was symmetrical or not, you would be making uh, approximately six or more vertical calculations in that intersection uh, to determine whether the intersection meets the vertical illumination. I will explain that vertical illumination is the only way, method that really allows the driver to know, you know, what illumination is on the pedestrian. So this is very specifically tied to pedestrian safety. This is uh, kind of a layout of what the an intersection might look like with pedestrian lighting. Um, the vertical illumination for the left turns and right turns would be primarily provided by luminaires on the mast arms. Now, if you've got a big intersection that meets this criteria that does not have mast arms, 
uh, one of right now the only way to to meet that criteria would be to change the signals from span wires to two mast arms just so you can get the lighting on the mast arms. You'll notice that each one of these we're using four mast arms in this particular intersection. Each one of those mast arms has a luminaire that's at 45 degrees to the signal arm. Now that is something different than what's in our current uh, 17745 index or index 17745 shows the luminaire to be directly over the arm. Um, we're working on changes to our indexes to, to show this new design. Uh, vertical illumination on the near side crossroads which are approaches to the crosswalks will be provided by the roadway roadway lighting. So it's really not part of the intersection. It's just moving the roadway lighting closer to the crosswalk. This is a rendering of what light levels should look like with the new methodology. Notice that the corners, especially the corners, radius returns and so forth are very well lit. Uh, this provides great uh, illumination for people making right turns to see pedestrians on the crossroad. We also have included in here a section on uh, the new criteria for roundabouts. The new criteria establishes criteria for roundabouts which is consistent with our signalized intersection in urban three areas. So the same uh, most cases you're not dealing with left turn conflicts but you're dealing with a lot of right turn conflicts so you would now analyze near side approaches and right turns the same way you would in signalized intersections as far as vertical illumination is concerned. Um, we've also added a table for mid-block crosswalks which shows the illumination level for mid-block crosswalks. For mid-block crosswalks, we're really not concerned with horizontal illumination. If this is in an area where there's no lighting, we're really only interested in providing vertical illumination for pedestrians in the crosswalk. You'll notice that if under low ambient light conditions, the 2.3 vertical foot candle vertical illumination applies, which is the same values we use at intersections. Uh, but for areas that have medium and high ambient light, we've raised that light level to 3.0 foot candles for vertical lighting. This is a table that's being removed from section 7.3. Um, it had to do with mounting heights for high pressure sodium cobra head fixtures. Uh, the July 2016 specifications will require that all our new lighting be a, an energy efficient light source such as LED. We added a veiling luminance requirement to the PPM in 2010. It was added back in 2010 because we started using top mount fixtures which could be tilted. And so we added it in 2010. But veiling luminance uh, specifically is is a method of calculating glare for different types of lighting. So it works for all types of lighting. Since this table was specifically for high pressure cobra head fixtures, it's no longer needed and has been removed from the table. So that ends kind of my presentation for section 7.3. Uh, we'll look at some of the changes that we made in section 7.6. Now, a lot of the changes well, nearly all of the changes that were made in Section 7.6 were issued in the Roadway Design Bulletin 15-02, uh, which it established new pavement marking selection criteria for both asphalt and concrete surfaces. Um, and basically the bulletin was rolled into to the PPM. Now we'll go over some changes that were made uh, between the bulletin and the issuance of the PPM. Um, I'm not going to go over all the changes that were made to 7.6 since the bulletin has been in effect since July 2015 
and we actually had a webinar that explained the changes as part of the bulletin. But there are some modifications that I'll go over that were made to the PPM which were not covered in the bulletin or which modified information that is in the bulletin. One of those was rumble striping. Uh, when we issued the policy on rumble striping, we had several districts that called us with concerns on how the MOT would, would work for rumble striping when we did not have a paved shoulder. Uh, the old criteria, most of it did not require that we uh, provide rumble striping on center lines. Our new criteria now says that all two-lane roadways will have rumble striping on the center line. Uh, the grinding equipment that grinds those center lines will hang over the center line by about approximately two feet. So vehicles coming from the oncoming direction have uh, has to move if you don't have a paved shoulder, would have to move over onto a grass shoulder. Some of the districts had some real concerns on roadways that did not have paved shoulders of uh, the methodology we would use. So we put a, a, an allowance in the, both in the rumble striping policy and in the profile thermoplastic. And it allows for roadways which do not have paved shoulders Profile thermoplastic may be used in lieu of rumble striping. So gives you an option other than rumble striping for those roadways. Um, one of the other changes that you may not notice, um, uh, it's not a, you know, a blatant, just comes out and says it, but if you'll notice our July 2016 specifications and some of our terminology that is in Chapter 6. We do not talk about projects where the permanent markings will be installed as a maintenance contract. And the reason for that, um, in the past, districts had the option to install permanent markings as part of the construction contract or to put them in a later contract in a maintenance contract. Uh, this option created issues in our specifications and on how to handle various marking materials. So we've been encouraging districts to move to putting the payment markings in a construction contract. Um, actually, at the Joint Director of Operations meeting in September of 2015, all the districts agreed that permanent markings would be installed in the construction contract and the pay permanent, maybe, permanent pavement markings would be installed as part of the construction contract where new paving was installed. So there's been some changes to 710 when we talk about uh, final surface markings. You'll find in the July 2016 workbook that there's no discussion about maintenance projects where the permanent markings will be at a later date. And the reason for that is we expect all projects to have the permanent markings in the construction contract. Um, one change that was not in chapter sub, section 7.6, I think it was probably mentioned earlier in the presentation, was a change that was made in chapter 8, specifically 8.3.1, which expands the use of special emphasis crosswalks to crosswalks at all approaches to signalized intersections. So. Section 7.6.14 requires that special emphasis crosswalk markings utilize preformed thermoplastic materials. So that change in Chapter 8 will expand the use of special emphasis markings. With that, uh, do we have any questions? The first question is, the new IES procedure for calculating roadway lighting which RP814 requires luminance rather than illuminance. And I am familiar with that. If you look at RP8, it says that you can should use luminance requirements uh, except in which are used mainly on straight section. If you have curved sections, you cannot use luminance in a curved roadway. So 
rather than having a mixture of luminance calculations and illuminance calculations, we have established only one method. The other problem with RP8 is that it measured light levels only on the through roadways. We are also interested in what the light levels are on sidewalks, in right turn lanes, and in left turn lanes. So we're not going to follow the RP8. We've established our own criteria. Um, will light levels be established for multi-use paths? It, there is a section under roadways, I think it's specifically table 7.3.1, that talks about uh, sidewalks. It said sidewalks, if they're adjacent to roadway, will meet the same requirements of the roadway. But if you're talking about shared use paths, the light levels are established, I think, are 2.3 foot candles. So that is already out there. It says in here, regarding PPM section 7.3.2.4 at existing mid-block crosswalks with no lighting fixtures, is a 3R project automatically required to install new lighting requirements, or does the warrant and analysis still apply? Um, the requirement to light crosswalks is in the traffic engineering manual, and it is specifically states for new crosswalks you should provide roadway lighting. So we don't require you to go back and retrofit all mid-block crosswalks to require lighting, uh, but I would look at them and see where they are, and if there's uh, it may be a good idea to, to add lighting, but it's not required. Um, it says in Table 7.34, lighting is ambient luminance um, based on engineering judgment. Are these values associated with low, medium, and high? Uh, this ambient luminance is discussed a lot in, in IES RP8, uh, talking about what ambient luminance is. Ambient luminance low means that there is basically no existing lighting in that particular area. So it would be really a dark mid-block crosswalk. If you have any kind of lighting, roadway lighting, um, lighting that's an interest to it, you know, along the roadside where you have a lot of businesses and so forth, you would be using the the medium to high values. Um, the next one is, um, are light criteria only when we are installing lighting, or does Chapter 7 require us to light areas such as sidewalk? If you have a sidewalk along the roadway and you are installing lighting, the sidewalk has to be evaluated as part of the roadway lighting and must meet the 1.5 foot candles. Um, it says, did you say the July 2016 specifications will require LED for all state roadway lighting? That is correct. Uh, effective with July lightings, all projects are supposed to use LED lighting. At signalized intersections where concrete strain poles are used. If mast arms cannot be installed due to funding, are we still held to the new intersection lighting criteria? Uh, that is strictly going to have to be a judgment call. The reason we went to urban three areas is because we felt like that eventually those intersections would have a lot of pedestrians. If you have an intersection right now that is has high pedestrian traffic and it's using strain poles and span wires, there's really no method to light the crosswalks or to provide vertical lighting other than install an additional pole in the return. Um, now I would say if you've got pedestrian, a lot of pedestrian activity and you've got I would evaluate the uh, crashes record at that and see if you have pedestrian crashes. But if you currently have an intersection that would span wires with high pedestrians and pedestrian crashes, 
I would strongly consider changing it out to mast arms. Um, so some maintaining agencies do not want luminaires on mast arms at the intersection. Um, the intent of this is the luminaires that are installed on mast arms are not tied to the electrical service of the signal line or the controller. There will be a circuit uh, conduit that goes to the mast arm from the lighting circuit. So the maintenance and so forth of the light on the luminaire will still be with the maintaining agency. So there should be no need to get into the uh, no reason why you know the lighting people could not maintain it even though it's on a lumin on a mast arm. If you have other questions about that, you might want to give me a call about it. This is Derwood again. I'm just going to cover a couple of the other questions that came in about Chapter Four. Um, one of them was, will the 10-foot lateral offset requirement for temporary barriers be included in the design standards? Um, no. Uh, you know, one of the um, moving forward, one of the intents with the design standards is to remove any of the design criteria from them. Um, so, uh, you know, we weren't going to add this to a place we didn't want it to start with, but there will also be follow-up efforts with a lot of the standards to take criteria information out of the standards and put it where it belongs, either in the PPM or maybe if it's specification type language, put it where it belongs. Um, the other question was, is shielding required if a Gravity wall drop off is greater than two feet from the edge of a pathway. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by a pathway, but if you have a vertical drop off within the clear zone of a roadway, then it would not be considered traversable and therefore would require at least um, an evaluation through RSAP to determine whether or not a barrier would be um, justified or not. Um, and then the other one was. Where is the setback to the slope break diagram in the PPM? It is not located in the PPM. Uh, I should have said that during the presentation. That one little clip is actually from the new um, design standard index, um, but it's said in words in the PPM that there is a requirement for all barriers to have a minimum two foot setback from the back, either from a, if it's guardrail, it's the back of the post, if it's a if it's a shoulder barrier, there's also a requirement for a two-foot offset to a shoulder break point there as well. 